Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz, your host again for Ability to Learn. Today is Thursday, November 5th, 2020. And for today's show, we got chock full of information, some useful, some fun. Also showing you some cool landmarks in the country of Panama and a whole lot of other interesting facts you should know. Now, in case you didn't know, there are daily Zoom sessions for you to participate in and enjoy, provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program educational team. Be sure to log in at least once a day. All right, Discovery Learners, let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Donut Day. Mmm, I love donuts especially with coffee. National Donut Day on November 5th is one of two observed by donut lovers across the nation. The first is Friday in June. History disputes the origin of the donut. One theory suggests Dutch settlers brought donuts to North America much like they brought other traditional American desserts. They receive credit for such desserts as the apple pie, cream pie, and the cobbler. Donuts come in many shapes. Was the original donut round? If so, American Hansen Gregory laid the claim to inventing the ring-shaped donut in 1847. He was on board a lime trading ship, only 16 at the time. Gregory claims he punched a hole in the center of the dough with the ship's tin pepper box. Later, he taught the technique to his mother. The more traditional spelling is donut, D-O-U-G-H-N-U-T. However, both donut and donut, D-O-N-U-T, are both commonly accepted in American language. Donuts come from a large variety of recipes, flavors, and toppings. However, just like many pastries, we are only limited by our imagination and ingredients at hand. From syrups and jellies to sprinkles and custards, top them, fill them, bake them, fry them, donuts have a mouth-watering way of glazing and dusting the way into our shopping carts. They also slip into the break room at work or at school to share. So how do we observe National Donut Day? Stop at your favorite donut shop and indulge your taste buds to a freshly made donut. Do you like donuts, Discovery Learners? And if you do, what flavor do you like? Do you like them with sprinkles? Do you like them plain? Do you like them with fillings? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Men Make Dinner Day. I never heard of this observance, but I'm already liking the sound of it. National Men Make Dinner Day is on the first Thursday of November places the man of the house in charge of the kitchen and the evening's meal. Some men like to cook and do so on a regular basis. To those men, I say kudos to you. This day was created for the men who do not know their way around the kitchen and are not familiar with cooking appliances as well as the women in their lives who need a well-deserved break. Men need to be aware that there is a list of rules that must be followed, some of which include the main meal must include a minimum of four ingredients and require one cooking utensil other than a fork. The man must go shopping for the necessary ingredients. He must clean up as he goes. And no, using a barbecue pit is not allowed. And aprons are optional. So how do you observe men cook dinner day? Have the men of the house prepare the meal, or if it's male staff, have the male staff prepare their meal this time. This should be fun. Hopefully they don't make a mess. Have you ever cooked a meal before Discovery Learners? Did you ever help in the kitchen? Leave your answers in the comment section below. Another observance for today is National Love Your Red Hair Day. National Love Your Red Hair Day celebrates the beauty of those gorgeous red trusses annually on November 5th. There's no reason to be shy. Redheads get the spotlight to show the unique qualities of red hair. Many redheads feel like an outcast for having red hair. This celebration empowers redheads to feel confident, look amazing, and rock their beauty. Red hair is more than a color. It's a lifestyle. Besides, redheads are rare. Less than 2% of the population are crowned with red hair, and those that are may very well be left-handed too. Some famous redheads include Lucille Ball, Queen Elizabeth I, Ron Howard, the artist Vincent van Gogh, Rupert Grint, who's an actor, Carol Burnett, a comedian, Winona Judd, and Carrot Top, another comedian. Most natural-born redheads have brown eyes, followed by green or hazel. 
Coming in at 1% of the world's population, the blue-eyed ginger is the rarest kind, and redheads do stand out in the crowd, so each unique, impressively stunning redhead gets to show off their locks. So how do you observe? Love your red hair day? Redheads gather together. Share your red hair in all its glory. Short, long, curly, or straight? Red hair gets the spotlight today. I think red hair is very pretty. It also reminds me of the Little Mermaid. I think whether you're born with red hair or you dye your hair red, you should still celebrate this day. Do any of my Discovery Learners have red hair? Let me know in the comment section below. An important observance for today is World Tsunami Awareness Day. In 2020, World Tsunami Awareness Day encourages the development of national and coastline community level local disaster risk reduction strategies to save more lives against disasters. By the year 2030, an estimated 50% of the world's population will live in coastal areas exposed to flooding, storms, and tsunamis. Having plans and policies in place to reduce tsunami impacts will help build more resilience and protect populations at risk. It's very important to ask, does your national or local community have a plan in place to anticipate a tsunami? Well first, what is a tsunami? The word tsunami comprises the Japanese word su, meaning harbor, and nami, meaning wave. A tsunami is a series of enormous waves created by an underwater disturbance usually associated with an earthquake occurring below or near the ocean floor, sometimes by volcanic eruptions, some mariner landslides, and coastal rock falls can also generate a tsunami, as can a large meteor or asteroid impact in the ocean. They originate from a vertical movement on the seafloor, with consequent displacement of water mass. Tsunami waves often look like walls of water that can attack the shoreline and be dangerous for hours, with waves coming every 5 to 60 minutes. The first wave might not be the largest, and often it's the second, third, or fourth, or even later waves are the biggest. So how do we observe World Tsunami Awareness Day? Well, if you live in a coastal community, seek out your community leaders and ask if they have a plan in place that anticipate dangers from tsunamis. Take part in regular drills. Having a plan and practicing the plan will help save lives. And their last observance is National Hot Sauce Day. Yes, on November 5th is Hot Sauce Day. Some people can't live without hot sauce. Made from chili peppers and other ingredients, spicy sauce lovers put it on everything from eggs to sandwiches to steaks. National Hot Sauce Day on November 5th is an excellent opportunity to show your appreciation for your favorite hot sauce. They come in a variety of styles, usually based on regionally available ingredients. They're also a staple in culinary cultures of many countries throughout the world. So how do you observe National Hot Sauce Day? Well, for one, if you never tried it, try it! Turn the international aisle of your local grocery store and pick up a couple different bottles of hot sauces from different regions around the world. You can also look up some recipes that call for hot sauce and cook with a couple different brands. Or you could make it. Making hot sauce isn't just for professional chefs. If there are some particular peppers or spices you like, try making your own at home. You can easily find a various recipes available online. Now I personally do not like hot sauce, but some people do. Do you like hot sauce discovery learners? And if you do, what's your favorite brand? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1872, Americans right to vote advocate Susan B. Anthony votes for Ulysses S. Grant and was arrested. Susan B. Anthony was an American social reformer and a women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. She was born to a Quaker family and committed to social equality. She collected anti-slavery petitions at the age of 17, and in 1856, she became a New York State agent for American Anti-Slavery Society. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting in her hometown of Rochester, New York and was convicted in a widely publicized trial. Although she had refused to pay the fine, the authorities declined to take further action, and in 1878, Anthony and Stanton arranged for Congress to be presented with an amendment giving women the right to vote. Introduced by Senator Aaron Sargit, a Republican from California, it later became known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. 
It was eventually ratified as the 19th Amendment in the U.S. Constitution in 1920. This is the amendment that allows women to vote in U.S. elections today. Today, in 1994, space probe Ulysses completes its first passage behind the sun. The Ulysses space probe was a joint European-slash-U.S. space probe launched in 1990. It was the first spacecraft to fly over the poles of the sun and return data on solar wind. The sun's magnetic field and other activity in the sun's atmosphere at high solar altitudes. Understanding such solar activity is important not only because the sun is an average star that is available for close scrutiny, but also because its activity has important consequences for Earth and its inhabitants, us. As dependence increases on space-based systems that can be affected by what has to become called space weather, which is largely driven by its solar phenomena. On November 5th, 1994, Ulysses space probe successfully made its way around the sun near the solar north pole. The Ulysses also flew by Jupiter and studied several comets that entered our solar system. It was later decommissioned in 2007, thus ending its 17 years in space. Today, in 1956, the Nat King Cole Show debuts on NBC, the first variety program to be hosted by African American. In 1956, the star singer and pianist Nat King Cole became the host of a weekly national TV program, stepping into the biggest spotlight of an African American performer have ever had in the still young medium, which is television. Although it only ran for a little more than a year, Cole's program established a milestone and cultural struggle for civil rights, bringing him and many other talented artists, both black and white, into millions of American homes. In 1956, Nat King Cole was seemingly at the pinnacle of his success. Over the past 20 years, the pianist and the singer as the key component of the Nat King Cole trio, and then increasingly as a standalone vocalist, scoring big hits with songs such as Nature Boy and Mona Lisa. He was also increasingly being tasked with singing theme songs for major Hollywood movies. Nat King Cole was not the first African American to host a TV program. Pianist and singer Hazel Scott and vocalist Billy Daniels had each briefly hosted their own shows in the earlier part of the 1950s. But Nat King Cole was certainly the most popular and prominent black artist and celebrity to be featured in such a vehicle. His show was broadcasted weekly on NBC. Initially, the Nat King Cole show was 15 minutes long, which was pretty unusual in that age of television, and it aired on Monday nights, right before the news at 7.45. The Nat King Cole show did really well in ratings, but struggled to find a national sponsor. As time went on, more TV networks started to pick up the Nat King Cole show, and by July 1957, the growing ratings was enough to persuade NBC to expand the show into 30 minutes long and move it to Tuesday evenings. The show received sponsorship from Coca-Cola soon thereafter. The show lasted about one year, spanning five seasons. Some of the most memorable guests on the show have been Ella Fitzgerald, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and Eartha Kitt. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Vivian Lee. Born November 5th, 1913, in Darjeeling, India. This iconic classical actress of the silver screen became immortalized as Scarlett O'Hara in the 1939 Civil War romance Gone with the Wind. Her other notable films include Fire Over England, Toverich, and A Streetcar Named Desire. She unfortunately passed away in July 8th of 1967, but she would have been 107 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Vivian! Our next notable figure is Tilda Swinton. Born November 5th, 1960 in London, England. This British actress who won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in her role in the 2007 film Michael Clayton. She also plays the White Witch in the Chronicles of Narnia film franchise. Her other film credits include Snowpiercer, Only Lovers Left Alive, and The Grand Budapest Hotel. She recently played the role of The Ancient One in the Doctor Strange and Marvel Avenger movies. She turns 60 years old this year. Wow, happy birthday, Tilda! 
Another notable figure for today is Famke Janssen, born November 5, 1964, in Amstelveen, Netherlands. This Dutch actress became the most famous for playing the mutant Jean Grey in the X-Men film franchise. She also went on to play Xena in the 007 movie GoldenEye. Her roles in Nip Tuck and Taken also brought her additional fame. She turns 56 years old today. Happy birthday, Fumka! And our last notable figure for today is Kevin Jonas, born November 5th, 1987 in Teaneck, New Jersey. This American musician is the lead guitarist of the Jonas Brothers, who first appeared on the Disney Channel show Hannah Montana. That appearance broke cable records with 10.7 million viewers. The Jonas Brothers has also made appearances on Camp Rock, and Camp Rock 2, The Final Jam. The band is also known for playing songs for baby bottle pop commercials. He turned 33 years old today. Happy birthday, Kevin. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery throughout Panama, here are some things you should see. Starting with the Big Screw, also called El Tornillo. The Big Screw official name is the F&F Tower. It is an office building tower in Panama City, Panama. It has won many awards for being one of the top best skyscrapers in Panama. And it is also one of the most iconic buildings in Panama City. Another name for this tower is the Revolution Tower but it's more known for being called the Big Screw. The initial concept for the FNF Tower was purely theoretical idea based on the rotating geometry on a prism. This experiment was undertaken in the architect's studio and was observed by a prospective client who wished to appropriate the design of their own office tower. Hoping to create a trademark building, the client and design team worked with the original concept to come up with a feasible and unique design. The tower was a concrete structure allowing each floor to rotate at least 9 degrees from the floor below to create 4 small balconies on each office floor. The big screw reaches high of 797 feet into the air. Wow, that's tall. It has about 52 floors and even has the FNF logo at the top point of the tower. Located on a relatively small site, about 2,000 square meters, on a prominent commercial street in the city's well known banking district, it was built with a strict budget of 50 million US dollars. It is a very popular Panama landmark. One does not have to venture deep into the business district to see the tower. Anyone can see the tower from any part of Panama City. Wow, that's a pretty cool looking building. Next up is the Biomuso. The Biomuso is a museum focused on the natural history of Panama. It's located on the Amador Causeway in Panama City, Panama, and it was designed by renowned architect Frank Gehry. This is Gehry's first design for Latin America. The design was conceived in 1999 and the museum opened on 2nd of October in 2014. The Bayamuso highlights Panama's natural and cultural history, emphasizing the role of humans on the 21st century. Its galleries tell the story of how the rise of the Isthmus of Panama changed the world. On October 2nd, 2014, the Bayou Museum opened its doors to the public with five of its eight galleries. This first part of the story tells the importance of Panama and its natural and cultural evolution. The Gary design is expected to attract tourists and help grow Panama's cultural attractions. I really like museums, and this one's a pretty cool looking one. Next up is the most popular tourist attraction in Panama, the actual Panama Canal. The Miraflores Locks is one of the popular visitor centers near Panama City. Here's where all the inbound and outbound traffic from the Pacific side of the canal is controlled. Due to its proximity to Panama City, the government implemented this magnificent center for us to witness the engineering marvel at work. The Miraflores Visitor Center has three observation decks with a front row view of the ships transiting the canal and the Panama Canal Museum. With four exhibition halls, you can learn everything you need to know about the Panama Canal's history, current operation, and expansion projects. In addition, the Miraflores Locks offers facilities for our leisure, such as snack bars, restaurants, and a souvenir shop too. 
There are many visitor centers just like this one where you could witness ships going through the canal. But this happens to be the most popular one. Panama is a really cold country with lots to see. Well, not enough time to show it all. But what we did see was pretty interesting. Isn't Panama awesome? Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the capuchin monkey. The capuchin monkeys are new world monkeys. They are readily identified as the orange grinder monkey and have been used in many movies and television shows. The range of capuchin monkeys includes some tropical forests in Central and South America. In Central America where they are called white-faced monkeys or cara blanca, they usually occupy the wet lowland forests of the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica and Panama. Capuchins are black, brown, buff, or whitish, but their exact color and pattern depends on the species involved. Capuchin monkeys are usually dark brown with a cream or off-white coloring around their necks. They can reach a length of 12 to 22 inches with tails that are just as long as their body. On average, they weigh from 3 to 9 pounds and can live up to 25 years old in their natural habitats. Just like most New World monkeys, capuchins are mostly active during the day and dwell in trees. With the exception of a midday nap, they spend their entire day searching for food. At night they sleep in the trees, which between branches. They are undemanding regarding their habitat and can thus be found in many different areas. Capuchin monkeys are omnivores and consume a variety of plants such as leaves, flowers, and fruits. Sometimes seeds and woody tissue and sugarcane as well. Some of the meat they eat are anthropods such as bugs, ants, spiders. Some of these clever little monkeys even use tools when hunting for food, like sticks and rocks. Some have been reportedly seen catching frogs. And capuchins that live near water also eat crabs and shellfish by cracking their shells with stones. Capuchin monkeys live in large groups from 10 to 35 individuals within the forest. Despite that, they can easily adapt to places that have been colonized by humans. Capuchins prefer environments that give them access to shelter and easy food, such as low-lying forests mountain forests, and rainforests. They use these areas to shelter at night and food access during the day. The canopy of trees allow for protection from threats of above, and the capuchin monkey's innate ability to climb trees with ease allows them to escape and hide from predators on the jungle floor. I think these little monkeys are so cute, and I know I've seen them in movies. I think the one I can recall the most is Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. There was a capuchin monkey in that movie too. What do you think of the capuchin monkey? Let me know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the papaya. It originates from the tropics of the Americas, perhaps from Central America and Southern Mexico. The papaya is a small, sparsely branched tree, usually with from a single stem that can grow up to 16 to 33 feet tall. With sparsely arranged leaves confined to the top of the trunk, and the lower trunk conspicuously scarred where leaves and fruit were born, the papaya's leaves are very large. They can measure up to 20 to 28 inches. The papaya flowers are sweet scented and only bloom at night and they pollinate with the help of the wind or insects. The papaya fruit is actually a large berry that is generally spherical or cylinder in form. It can measure up to 5 to 17 inches long and about 3 to 11 inches in diameter. You'll know it's ripe when it feels soft, like, like an avocado or softer. Its skin is like an orangey amber color and the seeds on the inside of the papaya are black. Although the papaya originated in Central America, it's actually India is the biggest world producer of papaya. And it's very popular fruit in Southeast Asia, especially to cook with. Green papaya, for example, is used in Southeast Asian cooking, both raw and uncooked. In some parts of Asia, the young leaves of the papaya are steamed and eaten like spinach. But that's just one of many ways to cook or eat the papaya. I like papaya. I usually chop it up and take out all the seeds and eat it with some tahini, which is like chili powder. Sometimes along with other fruits. Have you ever tried papaya? And if you did, did you like it? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to know. And now for the word of the day. Our first word of the day is endangered. 
It's an adjective. It means in regards to a species seriously at risk of extinction, endangered. Our next word is suffrage. It's a noun. It means the right to vote in political elections, suffrage. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Today's art is Mola of the Kuna Indians is a textile art created by the Kuna people from Panama. The word Mola comes from the word Kuna or words Dulegaya meaning clothing. During the arrival of the Spaniards and the missionaries to America in the 15th century, new materials and changes in customs also arrived, including cloth. Initially, kunas painted their skin with drawings, like tattoos, but they were then transformed to fabrics and then became the beautifully colorful, handcrafted piece of art we see today. According to the Kuna's belief, which is transmitted from generation to generation through songs, it is said that three deities descended among them. The first two gods were twins. The first one name was, now bear with me, Ulanita Lip Lip Ilir, and the second one was called Kubaye. The third deity's name was Yamangang. These three deities were credited in teaching women how to make hammocks, prepare threads, fabrics, cotton, to sew, to take care of children, to make pots, jars, and prepare food and drinks. They are also credited with teaching the Kuna women how to draw, because originally the mola was drawn on the skin. Kuna women are expected to create their first mola once they hit puberty. It's sort of a rite of passage. We can classify the mola of the Kuna Indians into three large groups, abstract forms, or images inspired by their dreams, geometric forms usually taken from shapes of plants or trees, and living forms, which are depictions of living creatures that can be found all throughout Panama. Wow, these textiles are beautifully crafted with such colorful and intricate designs. What do you think of the Mola Discovery Learners? Let your answers be known in the comment section below. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that the moon is very hot? It's true. The temperature on the moon averages about 224 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, but it's very cold during the night. It averages about minus 243 degrees. Back in the 60s, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the temperature they took with their scientific instruments read 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very hot. So why is it so hot and so cold on the moon? That's because Earth's moon has no atmosphere to hold in the heat at night or prevent the surface from getting too hot during the day. A single day on the moon lasts about 28 Earth days meaning our lunar daytime is nearly two earth weeks long. Yikes. But yeah, the moon could get really, really hot. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team.